DNA. We all know what depictions of it look like. Details vary between pictures, but the back and forth weaving outline of two parallel strands that form a double helix is unmistakable. Today, this sinuous image of nucleic acid is such an icon of the idea of biological life that it can be a surprise to think that only 60 years ago, less than the span of an average human lifetime ago, nobody would have recognized it. It was in 1953 that Watson and Crick discovered the double helix shape of this central molecule of life. Now we know that this double-sided, twisting form, tiny and invisible though it may be, is at the atomic heart of not only sexual reproduction, but all the vital signs of nature. We are learning to engineer it. If we proceed wisely, the promise and potential is to grow more nutritious crops of food, to create wonderful medicines, to remedy traumatic diseases, and to extend youth, health, and life as never before. It's not the first time, though, that the double helix has become a cultural icon among people, or that it has been associated with the very same areas of biological life that we now associate it with. This sketch traces the outlines of an image on a classic Sumerian relic, which is this libation vase, now at the Louvre Museum. A couple of winged mythological animals, leopards maybe, face the central motif of two interwoven snakes. Sumerian depictions of the double helix like this are the origin of the traditional design of the caduceus. It's a well-known image that has survived the years and come all the way up through history into our own time. In Sumerian minds, the image of a double helix represented what was for them the mystery of biological life and the reproductive and regenerative powers of life. Clearly, these are the same things that we now associate with DNA. We know what the double helix meant to the Sumerians from the name of the god whose emblem it was and from the prayers that were directed to that god. The double helix symbol was a long-term and abiding one in Sumerian mythology, spanning the entire lifetime of their culture. This, for example, is one of the oldest cylinder seals ever found. We see the classic outline of the interwoven snakes above the horned figure, who looks a lot like the horny little hoofed character that Greeks later in history called Pan. It dates to about 3500 BC, the very sunrise of Sumerian civilization. On the other hand, this vase is from almost a millennium and a half later, about 2100 BC, the very last era of Sumerian civilization. This vase was made at the behest of a certain Sumerian king for ritual purposes. The inscription on the vase tells us that the king Gudea dedicated the vase with its double helix to the god Ningish Zida. Now, that name is a mouthful, Ningish Zida. Let's see if we can tease out the truth a little bit here. The name Ningishida itself means Lord of the Productive Tree. A substantial proportion of the Sumerian population were orchard men, so the process of trees bearing fruit was an important one for them. Ningishida was a fertility god in the sense that fertility involves growth and fruition, the production of living tissue. Another name for the productive tree is simply the tree of life. Ningisida was the lord of the tree of life. Of course, beyond the growth of fruits and vegetables, the survival of people depended on having enough sheep, cattle, and game animals. This ancient piece of Sumerian art features a scene of men cutting meat in a butcher shop. It too dates from about 3500 BC. It's very old, from a proto-literate era. And there's no inscription on this, so no interpretation of this scene can be absolutely confirmed. But in a later era, the double helix was associated with the deity, Hermes, who was the patron of shepherds. Maybe a little back engineering is valid. What we can say for certain about this practically prehistoric piece of art is that we see the double helix at the center of the action in the butcher shop. Perhaps it's there as a ritual invocation or a nod to the god of the tree of life whose powers to cause reproduction and to guarantee the birth of new generations of animals were believed to ensure a continuous supply of food. Beyond agricultural fertility, the god who was manifested in the double helix also played a role in another aspect of biological life, namely human health and longevity. We know this because the inscription on the vase tells us that it was dedicated by Gudea to Ningisida in connection with Gudea's prayer that his own life should be a long one. In Sumerian art, the god spirit of biological life was usually represented by snake-like forms, but it didn't have to be two snakes. Even a single snake, as seen here in an upright position behind one of two figures who are facing the tree of life, was enough to signify the presence of that spirit. In the fancy of some of the earliest Sumerian artists, Ningishida could also be represented as a combined figure, a cross between a snake and a man. 
as you see them in these pictures. The bottom line is that one way or another in Sumerian art, the god of biological life was depicted by and through a sinuous or serpentine form. So we have not only the growth of tissue and concomitantly the generation of fruit, but also the length of a person's lifespan, absolutely connected with the deity whose emblem has the form taken by nucleic acids. It's a rather astounding coincidence. The essential question is this, what kind of coincidence is it? Is it just a happenstance design, a mere coincidence? Or was it caused deliberately by an intelligent agent among the early Sumerians who already knew very well what the central molecule of life looks like? What you decide will be a matter of your opinion. Let's see if we can wrap up the database of evidence for you. Let's fast forward through history and quickly follow the progress of the, the one snake, two snake, caduceus complex right up into our own time. Within a few generations after Gudea dedicated his face to the spirit of the double helix, Sumerian civilization fell to a big wave of invaders. When they took over the region, the invaders moved into a city where the Sumerians had recently built a towering ziggurat, and they made it the region's new capital. Babylon. Old Babylonian artists tended to depict the double helix as sort of an angular cross-hatched design that often involved the legs of characters. An important feature of the way the double helix artistic complex is sometimes presented during the Babylonian ages is that the two snakes are detached from one another and held apart in a person's separate hands. In other words, the helix is split in two and deliberately divided by a human-looking figure. Another way of looking at this is as a visual double entendre, in that the action and progress along the helix could be interpreted as proceeding from top to bottom or from bottom to top. I don't know of any Sumerian art where we see this act of disjoining the two parts. Of course, a lot of Sumerian art is lost in the sands of time. One thing is certain, though, by about 1600 BC, which is roughly the date of the picture here, art that shows the two snakes uncoupled and held one in each hand was not only featured in Babylon, but had spread beyond the Tigris-Euphrates area. Case in point is this statuette from Minoan Crete. This busty little female is the Minoan goddess, believed to have represented fertility to the Cretans. She's posed in her well-known and traditional posture, holding the uncoupled snakes up and apart. The general idea of the act of separating the two snakes being somehow associated with fertility made for a simple image that had a lot of staying power. Judging by this artifact, which shows a female sitting in a traditional birth-giving posture from a much later date, all the way up in northwestern Europe, the ancient civilization along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers finally began to feel the effects of its old age about 500 BC or so. At that time, a fresh young civilization to the west was just coming into its strength. From the outset of Greek civilization, the artistic complex that symbolically represents the vital force of life in the form of a double helix was a fundamental part of Greek art and culture. Images of this kind continued to be emblematic of reproduction and fertility and health. The Greeks did something a little different, though, in that they divided the one-snake symbolism from the two-snake symbolism. The two-snake double helix acquired the name Caduceus among the Greeks, and it was the design associated with reproduction and fertility. On the other hand, the sinuous figure formed by a single snake became associated primarily with health and medicine. The Caduceus was carried by the god Hermes. Hermes began as a fertility god. He was also the messenger of the gods. He brought communications from the gods and goddesses on Mount Olympus down to mortal men and women. Hermes was very much associated with human sexuality. Before about 400 BC, Hermes was sometimes represented simply by the image of a phallus, or when he was shown in human form, he was shown with an exposed penis, usually with an erection. It wasn't until roughly the 300s BC that Hermes began to be represented as the athletic-looking character with the wings on his feet that we know him as. Much of the mythology that surrounds Hermes has to do with human sexual reproduction. In fact, he fathered a family of deities that are associated with exactly that. Notice that among Hermes' offspring is Pan. We saw a character that was at least his look-alike, in a Sumerian setting several millennia earlier. Hermes was also the patron of shepherds and cattlemen. He was associated with the powers of animal reproduction. Then there was Asclepius. The sinuous image of one snake coiled around the staff was called the Rod of Asclepius. He was quite a different god than Hermes. Asclepius was the god of health, medicine, and healing. Greek mythology said that Asclepius fathered daughters who were goddesses of hygiene and remedy. Among them was Panacea, the goddess of remedy for whatever ails you. Let's talk for a moment about the single helix. 
The rod and snake of Asclepius is essentially a spiral around the central axis, and as such, it has its own analog in the world of nucleic acids. Part of the business of DNA functioning involves the division of its two strands into single units. What's more, the other important nucleic acid that's involved in biological life is RNA. RNA manifests as a single helix. With the rise of the Roman Empire, the character of Hermes underwent a name change and became the Roman god Mercury.